one of the most famous fashion districts of the world, standing out like a sore thumb against an otherwise conservative and conformist society. It has birthed some of the most creative fashion styles and brought the word kawaii to a non-Japanese consumer. But how did Harajuku become what it is today and is Harajuku dying? Today we will look through the history of Harajuku and find out. Today's video is again a little bit different from the ones I usually make apart from my previous one which was this but about convenience stores. I'm honestly just having a lot of fun making this kind of content right now. They do take a lot of research though so they do end up taking more time than my regular videos but I hope that you will still be able to enjoy them. And since I did put so much effort into this video I would really appreciate it if you would give it a like and maybe comment your thoughts down below. And if this is your first time on my channel why not hit that subscribe button? I do also apologize in advance because I might end up looking at my laptop quite a bit. I have so many many notes and there's just no way I'll be able to memorize any of this so please bear with me. But before we get into it I would like to quickly thank the sponsor of today's video Health Vision and their made in Japan cat treats called Bio Nature. This is definitely a very different sponsor from the ones I normally have but I do have cats so when they reached out to me I was intrigued. I'm always looking for good cat treats that they can enjoy and since the Bio Nature cat treats are 100% natural, low sodium and low phosphorus I figured it was worth trying out. They come in these really cute colorful packets and they're a paste type of treat Lala only eats dry treats but Teddy really liked it. You can tell he really liked it because for some reason when he really likes a treat he growls. I don't know why he does that. I really like these because they're kidney friendly and taking care of your cat's kidneys is really important. So many cats end up getting kidney problems as they age so it's definitely worth taking care of your cat's kidneys. But even if you have a cat with an illness they have medical assist and high calorie treats that can help your cat while they're recovering. Their ingredients are carefully selected, human grade, 100% natural with no preservatives, no artificial coloring, no seasoning and they are vet recommended. It is a veterinarian exclusive product so why not ask your vet about it next time you go. I'll put a link to the website in my description. Thank you again to Health Vision for sponsoring this video. Let's move on to the history of Harajuku. Let's start with the name Harajuku. The name Harajuku actually dates back to the Kamakura period which began in the year 1192. I'm really bad with numbers. However, before the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, they actually changed the address to Jingu Mae. In an effort to make Tokyo more easy to navigate, a lot of addresses were being changed at the time in Tokyo. Also because apparently a lot of post was getting lost. And they chose Jingu Mae because it's in front of Meiji Jingu. Jingu means shrine, Mae means in front of, in front of the shrine. So interestingly, Harajuku is not an official address at all. The station is called Harajuku, but that's about it. Officially, the area is called Jingu Mae. Some of the town bulletins do still refer to it as Harajuku though, which I thought was quite cute. The area around Cat Street used to be called Onden. There is a theory that the place name is derived from a samurai named Onda and that the Tokugawa family renamed the place where Mr. Onda was hidden to Onden. Also around Takeshita Street, the area was called Takeshita Cho, which means bamboo downtown. Bamboo downtown. Sounds like a good time. The history of that seems less interesting. It was probably just because there was some bamboo there. Moving forward to Harajuku in the Edo period. Yes, we are starting from the Edo period, which started in 1603. Harajuku at this time was where the Iga people lived, or ninjas. Harajuku had a strategic placement south of the Koshu Road, and so they were placed there to defend Edo. At that time, they had a lot of water wheels around the area to like feed the crops. And I found this really beautiful ukiyo-e of Harajuku at the time. It's called Hold the Water Wheel at Onden by Katsushika Hokusai. Where Cat Street is now, there was originally a big river as well. And if you look closely at Cat Street now, you can still find the old pillars. Moving on to the Meiji period, which started in 1868. If you don't know about the Meiji period, it's basically when Japan officially opened itself up to other countries. Before that, only a very few number of countries were able to enter. But then they opened up and they started their industrial revolution. And this is when the capital Edo was renamed to Tokyo, which Harajuku became a part of. The name Jingu Maya, as I mentioned earlier refers to the Meiji Jingu Shrine, which was completed in 1921 and dedicated to the spirit of Emperor Meiji. Harajuku Station was opened in 1906, originally closer to where Yoyogi Station is now, but after the Great Kanto Earthquake in 1924, it was moved. Apparently at first the number of passengers wasn't that high, but then Meiji Jingu was built in 1919 and it skyrocketed. Mostly because a lot of people were actually working on building the shrine, so they had to go there for work. It was famously the oldest wooden station in Tokyo until... 
the 2020 Olympics. And it was rebuilt to a bigger and more modern station. There was a lot of controversy regarding this because it was such an iconic part of Harajuku, but when it comes down to it, the new station is more accessible, especially for people with wheelchairs or who otherwise have difficulty moving around. You know, mums with prams, anyone like that. So, I think I accept the new change. Moving on to 1945 during the war, Harajuku was very heavily bombed. Let's move on. In 1946, they built Washington Heights. This is really interesting to me because I'd never heard of this before. It was essentially military housing for the Americans where Yoyogi Park is now. Washington Heights had a really huge impact on Harajuku today because this is basically when Harajuku began to have this like international image. Because interestingly, Kitty Land was originally put up for the Americans. It was originally a bookstore and a general store. And Oriental Bazaar, you know the one that looks like a temple, was originally also put up for the Americans to buy souvenirs from. Also where La Forêt was, there was a church. It's so weird to imagine Harajuku as like a normal little American town. The American military and their families lived there until the 1964 Olympics where they were all moved to different bases. The houses were actually used to keep the Olympians and one building still remains, which I believe was the Dutch Olympians' house? In 1958, Omota Sando Central Apartment was built, originally intended for use by the American military personnel, but eventually became a popular spot for photographers, illustrators and directors to meet up due to the availability of offices and storefronts in the building. It also had the famous coffee shop Leon on the first floor, which famously served people involved in the media. On top of that, in 1973, the shopping district Harajuku Plaza opened in the basement of the apartment, which was frequented regularly by musicians. While the building no longer exists as is, you may know it as Turkey Plaza, you know, the building with the mirrors and the rooftop Starbucks. Yep, that was originally Omotosanjo Central Apartment. I would personally say the 70s is when Harajuku, as we know it, really started to develop. The 70s was a really big era for Japanese fashion. To begin with, Kenzo Takeda, rest in peace, was the first Japanese designer to break into Paris, mixing a colorful jungle style with his Japanese heritage. I will not say the brand name, but you may know it now as Kenzo. He rented out a small shop in Galerie Vivienne where he also had his first fashion show. With great leaps being made in high fashion, it's no surprise Japanese street fashion was also flourishing. <laughs> One such style is Lolita, which is characterized by Victorian style and Rococo style clothing with an emphasis on cuteness. There are a whole bunch of different subcategories within Lolita, such as the main three being Gothic, Sweet and Classic, but if you've seen anyone who wears Lolita, you'll know that they are extremely creative with how they wear their style. A main feature of Lolita fashion is a voluminous skirt, typically bell or A-line shaped, which is created by wearing a petticoat or a crinoline. As I mentioned in my intro, Japan is a conformist society, with the famous phrase being, the nail that sticks out will be hammered down. So it may come as a surprise that so many unique styles were flourishing at the time. One reason is that Japanese youth historically stays with their families longer, resulting in more disposable income and a stronger youth culture. And then also the economic boom that Japan had in the 80s. However, as is the case with Lolita fashion, a lot of these styles actually grew against society's rules. This is known as counterculture. People are pressured to adhere to strict gender roles and expectations of their gender and their age. Lolita rebels against this by wearing a style that is extremely feminine, to a level that society typically deems too extreme or even childish. It also offers an escape to a fantasy world where you can choose whatever identity you want regardless of society's rules. But above all, it's just a lot of fun and it can increase your self-confidence. So how did Lolita fashion come to be? A lot actually influenced the start of Lolita. For example, Otomeke, which means maiden style, which rose in the 70s and was often shown in a magazine called Olive. And also the current concept of kawaii, which was really making great strides around this time as well. In fact, let me know if you want me to make a separate video about the history of kawaii, because that could be its own video. Also, I found some vintage olive magazines in Medicari, so if you guys would like to watch me go through those, do let me know, I could definitely make that video. After otomeke, a do-it-yourself attitude began to emerge, which led to the creation of doke, the predecessor of Lolita today. In the years 1977 to 1998, the roads of Harajuku actually used to close on Sundays for car traffic. 
traffic, which allowed a lot of interaction between pedestrians. And due to shops like Milk, Pink House and Angelic Pretty setting up shop around this time, this interaction really helped the growth of Lolita fashion. Milk is actually known to be the first Lolita brand. It's set up in 1970 and it actually still is making clothes, although I would say they're not really Lolita anymore. It was established by Hitomi Okawa, right in the Harajuku Central apartment that we discussed earlier. Interesting developments in Harajuku in the 70s includes the commercialization of Takeshita Street, which you may now know to be one of the most iconic shopping streets in Harajuku. It features crepe stands, a huge Daiso, and a large number of kawaii fashion brands with staff outside yelling out the latest deals in their shop. The first crepe shop opened on Takeshita Street in 1977, and originally it did not perform all that well, but due to media coverage, it has now come to symbolize Harajuku itself. In 1979, boutique Takenoko opened up selling dance clothing that soon inspired the dance group Takenoko Zuku. The group featured a large number of mostly middle and high school students who danced together on the streets of Harajuku and Yoyogi Park. In 1978, La Forêt opened, a department store featuring Japanese brands that is now considered to be a landmark of Harajuku. In the first year, La Forêt actually didn't do that well. They weren't really aiming for the youth at the time, but I think then they quickly caught on who the people around Harajuku were and they remodeled the inside to be more youthful and edgy and began to flourish. One really interesting fact is that Lafori actually took to partnering with youth fashion magazines and clothing brands to run fashion shows in the building during the 1980s and 1990s. Man, researching for this video just makes me really wish I could go back in time because this stuff all sounds so fun. As you can probably gather, Harajuku fashion was now fully in swing, developing into a countless number of styles. One such style is Visual K, which began to develop in the 1980s. Similar in style and culture to London's punk scene and glam rock, it's a fashion style that goes hand in hand with the music scene, namely J-Rock. It was introduced by bands like X Japan and is characterized by the excess, featuring a fashion that's always pushing the boundaries with flamboyant yet androgynous styles. Dark, gothic, historical and traditional influences are common. It really had its peak in the 90s, although to be honest with you, I was quite into it in the 2010s. I used to be really into the Gazette and I actually went to see Anne Cafe live in like 2012 or something. Needless to say, it's still very much active to this day. Moving on to the 90s, we have the Urahara boom. Shop owners couldn't afford the high rent of Harajuku and so they set up in what was at the time the more affordable, predominantly residential back streets. The kinds of shops set up at the time were mostly hip-hop and skate-inspired select shops, some of which eventually came up with their own designs, for example, a bathing ape. Also kind of a fun fact is that Takeshita Street at this time was mostly famous for like counterfeit goods, but then the government kind of honed in on it in the 2000s and it stopped. The 2000s brought the popularity of Harajuku to the rest of the world, with the internet allowing the international youth access, western pop stars incorporating the styles into their performances, and fashion magazines focusing on Harajuku fashion becoming more popular. One such magazine was Fruits, which at the time was one of the only ways that you could really peek in and have a look at what was popular in Harajuku at the time. It was founded in 1997 by photographer Shoichi Aoki and featured a simple layout with a bulk of the magazine made up of single full-page photographs accompanied by a brief profile of the photographed person. Internet forums for styles like Lolita began to appear and the youth of the Western world were starting to incorporate Harajuku fashion into their own fashion. In 2011, Kyaru Pami Pami released Pom Pom Pom, which became a viral hit and introduced millions of people to the concept of a Harajuku girl. Meanwhile, in Harajuku in the 2000s, there was a huge influx of fast fashion coming in, like Gap, H&M and Uniqlo. Harajuku has very quickly become a commercial success, even in the West but some say this was the very thing that killed it. So, is Harajuku fashion dying? This really depends on who you ask, and I don't even know what I would say my opinion is myself. I actually would really appreciate your thoughts in the comments on this, so do let me know if you have any thoughts about this. To give you someone else's view though, after 20 years and 233 issues, Shoichi Aoki announced in February 2017 that Fruits magazine would cease publication effective immediately because there are no more cool kids to photograph. That's a quote, he said that. <laughs> Jingu Bridge has also become a lot less popular. It's the bridge that's just outside the station. It used to be a really cool place for the Harajuku kids to hang out, but apparently they just don't go there anymore. I do feel a bit of heartache when I look at the old pictures and videos of Harajuku. Even 2017 when I first came feels like it was a lot different than it is now. But also like right now, so many shops ended up closing because of Corona, so 
I don't know if it's like a temporary thing. When it comes down to it though, styles change and trends change and it's very possible that this is just another evolution in Harajuku fashion. For example, K-pop inspired styles are very popular right now and also Jirai K, which I see a lot of in Harajuku right now. Also like thrifty style is like really popular right now. So it might just be that like the styles have just changed. It's not like they disappeared, they're just different than they were before, which every style is like that. Please do let me know your thoughts down below. I'd also love to hear what your favorite Harajuku styles are. If you know anything about the history of your favorite styles, I'd love to hear that as well. With that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and finish this video. Please do let me know if you like this style of video. Thank you ever so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, bye.